Welcome back to another episode of Learning with Zia. So today I'm going to be taking you through one of the most popular questions I've seen in technical interviews recently. So, all right, let's get into it. Cool. So I'm going to do this a little bit differently. And because I think that there are a lot of tutorials uh, online right now in YouTube where they talk about different ways of solving a problem. Now, I want to do it a little bit differently because I think that there's more to just solving the problem, right? There's no just one single way of solving the problem. And I want to show it to you through this channel, through this YouTube. Um, so, okay. So expect to see a little bit more of like more interesting ways of like tackling coding challenges uh, on this channel. So this is going to be like an experiment. I'm trying it out right now. I don't know how it's going to work. So give me any feedback. Let me know what you think. And then, um, yeah. You know, subscribe, let me know, comment, uh, or send me an email. That's great too. I've gotten a lot of feedback from people where they enjoy the coding sessions. They enjoy like going through those questions, but then um, they wanted to see something a little bit different where it's content that they can't find anywhere else on the internet. So there you go. Okay. So cool. All right. So for today's question, we're going to try something a little bit different, which is we're going to talk about one question. So for today's question, we're going to talk about... Okay. Hello. All right, let's talk about a coding question today. Okay, so question for today is... Given an array of numbers, find me the top K biggest numbers in the array. So the question is, given an array of numbers, find top k biggest numbers from the array. Uh, the way I think about this is I usually break up a coding question into multiple steps. And I think that's just a framework to help you understand and kind of um, structure your thought process so that it's much more systematic, it's, it's much more methodical. Okay, if you can imagine, Q-A-S-I, K-C. This is my K-C framework, <laughs> trademark. Okay, so let's talk about how to solve the problem. First thing is question. Second thing is assumption. Third thing is solution. Fourth thing, improvement. Okay, four steps, K-C, Q-A-S-I. So if you remember K-C, then this is gonna help you solve a lot of uh, a lot of coding questions uh, very very easily. So let's see how KC would kind of fit into this question that uh, that we're doing. First step, question, right? So the first thing is, are there duplicates? Okay. So typically when you get an array of numbers, uh, one of the things that you want to clarify is are there duplicates in there? Because you can imagine how that would, how that would impact your solution, right? It, it's very different if there are no duplicates and you're only asked to return top K versus if there are duplicates. Because if there are, and let's say you have nine, 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 do you just want to return one nine and then the next number? Or do you want to return nine, nine, nine? Okay. So, First thing, are there duplicates? And the third thing is, is the array sorted in any order? Okay, so with these three questions, I think that gives you a good overview of what problem you're trying to solve here. It limits the scope. With these three questions, let's say we provide some assumptions there. I am assuming X, Y, and Z. Because it helps you set up the framework of where or how you're actually gonna solve the problem. So I think this number two assumption here is very tightly related to first, okay? It's the first question, because once you've asked these questions, then you can make some assumptions about the solution. First thing is, are there duplicates? No, there are no duplicates. What is the input space? Let's assume we're only handling integers, right? And then the third thing is, is it sorted in any way? Let's assume that it's not sorted, because if it is, then the question actually is quite simple. Okay, so you can see how the question actually changes. 
For example, if this was not the case, if number one was not the case, if there are actually duplicates, right? So you have, right? So there are multiple duplicates in there, and maybe you want to return four, two, and one, or you could return four, two, two. Okay, two very different solutions. And then what if I said, okay, this is actually sorted, right? If it is sorted, then the question becomes very easy because you would just have to return the last few numbers. That's it. Okay. Three, solution. So solution-wise, typically for good candidates, I see them actually thinking about multiple different solutions. They're not just thinking of one way of doing it. They're thinking about, you know, brute force. They're thinking a much more space optimized or maybe time optimized uh, solution. So typically there are different solutions. There are different trade-offs. And it's much more important to talk about those trade-offs than just saying, hey, I think this is the fastest way of doing it. Let's go with that. Okay, so the first thing is, Sorting, okay? This is the most obvious solution I can think of. Okay, so this is the most obvious solution I can think of, right? That would solve the problem at hand. So you take in the array, you sort it, and then you just pick the last K elements at the end of it. That solves the problem, right? That's one solution. Uh, and that time complexity wise, that would be end of log n. Right, because you have to sort it, and space complexity will be O of one. Okay, because of you know quick sort. Quick sort is a highly efficient sorting algorithm, and in the best case scenario, it is O of n log n time and constant space. If you're interested to know more, I highly recommend checking it out on Wikipedia. I've included a link to it in the description below. Now. That's, I think that's pretty reasonable, but then can you do much better than that, right? Because obviously, you know, this time complexity, that's, that could be an overkill, right? Because now you're sorting an entire array, and then you maybe only need the top two numbers. Okay, okay cool. So that's one solution. Uh, maybe not that optimized. You can think about different, different optimization there. Uh, what about the different solution here? Now imagine you want to keep a collection of the largest. Here's an algorithm. At four, you insert four into your collection of largest elements, and then you move to the next one and you insert again, okay? Because you have k is two, and you insert 10 into your collection. And then the next step, you check again. Now, you're at two, and you compare two with everything in your collection so far. You see two is smaller than four and 10, so you don't do anything and you move to seven, and then you check, is seven larger than four or 10? Seven is larger, so you replace seven for four, and then you move on. And now you're at nine, you do the same thing. You compare nine and 10 and seven. Nine is bigger than seven, and you replace nine. That's one solution. Now notice that in this algorithm, the majority of your time is going to be spent on looking through every single element in your collection, right? So assuming that your k is large, that means your algorithm is not going to perform really well because it's going to check every single element in there in order to find one that is smaller than the current index. So can we think of a data structure that will help us in performing much more efficiently with this operation? So I think one data structure that could be really good for picking out uh, numbers is a heap. So how would a heap kind of fix, fit into this? Let's think about this. So a heap, there is the idea of a min heap and then there's the idea of a max heap. So a max heap has the guarantee that whatever is at the top of the heap is going to be the biggest and a mean heap other way around. So what does a mean heap will look like? So for example, you have 10, 19, 35. So as you, can, as you can kind of see here, there's a guarantee where the element at the top of the heap is smaller than all the other elements in the rest of the heap, and so on and so forth. So 15 is smaller than everything in here, 25 is smaller than everything in here, 19 is gonna be smaller than everything else uh, underneath it, okay? So that's a guarantee that you can get from this uh, heap structure. So how does a min heap help with our use case? In this case, your k is two, which means you're interested in the two largest elements in the array, okay? Now, 
So we know that the result of this is going to be seven and nine, okay? So that should be the output. And assuming that we don't care about the order of the final output, right? Could be seven or nine or nine, seven, doesn't really matter. All we really care about is that you're just giving me the two largest elements, okay? So how would a heap help us in this case? So let's assume that we have a mean heap over here. And there's an initialization process, right? You know that the size of the heap here is gonna be K, right? Because we only care about having the two largest elements. So let's assume that we have this size, uh, uh, let's assume that we have this mean heap over here with two elements, we have to initialize it, correct? So let's put these first two in the array into the heap. So how would this thing look like? So first we have seven, We, sorry, first we have one, we put it into our heap, that's gonna be one. And then we insert seven, okay, into a heap. Assuming because you, we can make the assumption that the heap is going to keep the data in here sorted at all times, where the top of the heap is always going to be the smallest. So this is the first step. First step is you have to initialize the heap. Okay, this is your first step. All right, now, after you're done with these first two elements, we start at four, okay? Here's what we do. We take four, which is the current element, and then we compare that with the top of the mean heap. And then we check, okay, here's what we're saying. If the top of the mean heap is smaller than the current element that we're looking at, we then kick out top of the heap, okay? And then we insert four, the current element, into the heap. So after this first operation, what does the heap look like? It's gonna look like this, okay? It's gonna look like four. Because again, there's this heapify function that is being run to make sure that your mean heap is satisfying the requirement, which is the top of the heap is smaller than everything else. So when you insert four into a heap, your four is gonna move all the way up to the top of the heap, and that is why the structure looks like this, a four and a seven. So notice at this point, without even looking at everything else, okay, we've just processed three elements here, and notice what does your mean heap look like. Your mean heap right now contains the two largest and the three elements that it has seen so far. Okay, make sense? So this mean heap essentially, it stores the smallest of the largest elements in here. And every time you're checking through the array, you're checking, hey, is this thing bigger than the smallest I've seen so far? If it is, kick out the smallest, insert this guy into it, and see, okay, what is the next smallest in the largest of what you've seen so far? Okay, so this thing right here is basically keeping a sorted order of everything you've seen so far. Let's continue, continue with this operation. Let's go to number two at this point. So we now compare two with the smallest of the heap so far. We compare four and two. Now, is four smaller than two? No, it's not, okay? So therefore, you don't do anything here. And then we check with the next one, okay? So you can see here what happens if smallest is smaller than current, okay? This is logic. If the current, so this, oh, sorry. If this is, this is the smallest. If smallest is less than the current, and this is your current, right? Then you pop and then you insert, okay? Insert current, sorry. Else you do nothing. And that's it. This is the logic of your entire algorithm. All right, so here's the important part, right? Doing, when you're doing any coding algorithm question, there's a time for an analysis. So we're concerned about time, space, analysis here. Let's think about this, time, okay? What do you need to do here? The first step is you need to pop things out of your heap, right? So popping things out of your heap is gonna be O of one, okay? Because every single time you're only popping from the top of the heap, constant time operation, plus you need to do a heapify, okay? You need to do a heapify function. So what is the time complexity for doing a heapify? Heapify is going to be log of the size of your heap, which is K in this case. The worst case scenario is we need to apply that logic across the entire array, assuming that the size of the array is gonna be O of n, okay? So it's gonna be O of n 
multiply by log of k. So your time complexity analysis here is going to be n times log k. Space. What about space? Space-wise, the only extra space we're going to incur in this, this case is going to be this heap. Okay? And what's the worst case scenario? As, as mentioned earlier, your heap is going to be size of k, right? Because we're only concerned about the number of k, k number of elements. So you're going to be O of k. So that's your time and space complexity analysis. Okay, so let's use a, we can use quick sort, merge sort, for example, to sort the entire array and then pick the top k, right? So we talk about that approach. But can we do better than n log n or n log k, right? So as a matter of fact, I think that we can, okay? So we take a look at this example. Um, if we go with a quick sort approach, and what does quick sort do? Quick sort, it picks a pivot and then everything smaller than the pivot will go to the left of the pi pivot. Everything larger than the pivot goes to the right. And using this example, let's see how we can accomplish this. Let's say we pick seven as your pivot in this case, right? Randomly selected, let's say you pick seven. Seven is your pivot. And what you're doing in this case is, after your first pass, let's see what happens. Your array will look something like this, right? Okay, here's what it looks like. And notice where is the location of your pivot, okay? It's right here. If you think about indexing, this is zero, one, two, three, and four, correct? Cool. So from here, we can see that everything on the left of the pivot is smaller. Everything on the right of the pivot is larger, okay? And we know what the size of this array is. Size of this array is going to be size of 5. Okay? Here's the tricky part. When you, look at the, when you look at the index of the pivot, you can actually tell how many elements are larger than the pivot. At, at that point, you should be able to know how many k elements are from that k point onwards. Does that make sense? So what this actually says here is that when your pivot is at index three and the size of the element, and the size of the array is five, you know that on the right of this pivot, there's only one element. Plus the, in, the pivot itself, now you have two largest elements in the entire array, okay? So now you just return seven and nine, that's it. But what if your k is larger, right? Let's say this k instead of two, it's three. Okay, so you wanna get the three largest and you know that the pivot is index three. Okay, so it ha only has the two largest. So you, kn you know that you need to find somewhere in here, the larger, element, you need to find another larger element, okay? So what do you do? Again, you apply the same operation here. You know that you have the two largest already, okay? So now you need to find one more. So let's say you pick another pivot. Let's say you pick two, okay? So two after the first pass, okay? You sort this entire thing out. It's gonna be one, two, four, okay? And this thing remains the same, seven and nine, okay? So now your index is gonna be one, okay? And you know that there's one larger element on the right of that pivot, which is four. So now you're done, okay? Because you know that you have two from the, the initial pass and you have one on the right side here. So you just return all three of them, four, seven, nine, okay? In that case, your time complexity here is gonna be O of N worst case, right? Because you can see how this thing works. First, you run through the entire array, okay? After that, you run on a smaller subset, and then if you need more, you're gonna run on an even smaller subset, okay? So it's gonna be n plus n over two plus n over four plus all the way, okay? So this will come back to O of n time complexity.
much faster. Okay, so here's a, a really, this requires a really good um, knowledge or understanding of how quicksort works. And I don't expect a lot of candidates coming to this understanding right away. So I would kind of propose this as sort of an optimization up top. If you're able to come to like a heap approach plus the other ones, I think that's going to be pretty good. Okay, cool. So the third solution here is writing a find max function and then go through the entire array. And each time it would just find the max element in the array. As a result of that, you have to run through that function k times in order to find the top k elements. Now, the complexity is here. When you do a find max, how do, how do you mark the one that you already looked at as no longer valid so, you don't, so that you don't pick it up the next time around? Because otherwise, if you run through it k times find max times, it would just return seven in this case, k times, right? So it's important to clarify whether it's possible to have a number uh, that, is, uh, that is negative, for example. So you can mark this as an invalid, right? For example, like a minus number, like maybe like a negative number is invalid. So we mark this as, as minus seven. And each time that you go through, you would just set the max number that you picked up as negative so that you won't pick it up again, okay? So the time complexity for this solution is going to be k times n, where the worst case scenario is k is the size of n, in which case it would be n squared solution. Um, space complexity wise, it's going to be O of 1 because you only have to go through it every single time and you don't have to store any extra additional space. So that's also one possible uh, solution. Great. So now you have three different solutions here. Which one do you pick? And that is a conversation that you want to have with your uh, interviewer, right? Or whoever that you're talking with or mock interview and where you can just kind of talk to them and say, hey, here are my three different solutions. I think that, you know, one, two or three is reasonable. And I have a strong preference for number two because, you know, of the reasons here. I think the time complexity is reasonable. I think the space complexity is it's pretty reasonable as well. It's a much more optimized solution compared to the first one. And then the third one, it's you're making a lot of assumptions because if those assumptions do break, then the entire solution would break. Okay, so there you go, right? So I think that presents a much more holistic candidate versus one who probably comes up with the number two approach right away because you're not seeing how they're thinking about the problem. Maybe they've seen this problem somewhere and they know what the ideal or optimized solution is, but then you, they, they're not really showing how they're thinking about the problem. So in this case, whenever you get a coding question, it's highly, highly advisable to go through different solutions that you can think of, even if it's incorrect, but just put it on there and kind of walk through it and, and, and kind of voice out your thought process. So now you have three solutions, great. And now you're just going with the second approach. Okay, all right, let's write some code to do it then. All right, let's get started then. Okay, so again, define, find, Top. Okay. All right. And then you have your input. Oh, let's call it array and then K. All right. So this again, just to kind of document this really quickly, say this will assume the array is not sorted. Only has integers and has no duplicates. Okay. And then some use case here. So input, for example, two, one, four, seven, three. K is three. Output should be seven, four, and three. All right, cool. So there you go. I think that makes sense. So let's write some code to do it. And again, we talked about using a heap, right? Um, before we do that though, let's handle some edge cases here. So if array is none, or um, k is larger than the length of the array, or length of array is zero, or k is more than the length of the array. So for example, if you have three elements in the array and you, you give four as k, then you know, you can throw an ex exception or just kind of return empty, empty array. I think that's uh, totally fine. So again, here you can chat with interviewer, see what the right solution is. Uh, how to handle. Okay, you can throw an exception and I think there are both pros and cons to either throwing an exception or just returning an empty array. 
Okay, cool. So now I believe that Python has a big heap queue, I believe. I have to pull it up real quick. And you have a heap queue and you want to initialize your results. You can empty, empty list and then for i and k. Um, so you want to kind of iterate through the entire array, array i. So this would be the value, current element. Oops. And you want to do a hip q, hip q dot push, hip push, and your results. And you want to do the current element in there. So, okay. Okay, so now let's write the implementation for this. And the implementation is gonna look something like this, right? Fill in the heap with k elements, walk through heap, and compare with top of heap. If larger than top of heap, pop, and then insert into heap. Right, something like that. I think this is the high level idea here. And I believe in Python, heap Q is a max heap. Okay, great. So this is a high level approach here. Um, and we will use a mean heap. So I believe that heap Q in Python is implemented as a, as a mean heap by default. Great. Okay, so typically what I like to do here is um, kind of fill it in something like this. Fill in heap and then results equals empty, right? Or I, I don't need to do that. Fill in heap and give it the array and size k, right? So I, typically I, what I like to do here is I give it a stuff and then I will say, okay, I will implement those things later on. And then, okay, cool. So now for each element in the array, for element in array, because you've already filled it in, so you actually want to start from k plus two. Does that make sense? Um, from Okay, so now you wanna walk through the heap and then compare with top of heap, okay? So before we do that, now we have to figure out that in fill in heap, it actually takes K elements and put it into your heap. And what happens after that is, so what happens after that is you actually, you're, you're actually starting, right? So instead of two, one, two, one, four, seven, three, so you are starting from this number four element, if k is two in this case, right? If k is two in this case, then you would have filled in one and two into your heap, and you want to start walking through the, the array from four, okay? So in that case, how would you do this? So for i in range of k to length of the array, okay? So what that does is that you will start from 0, 1, 2. So you started from index 2, 3, and 4 up until but not equals to the length of the array. Current element, okay. I kind of typically like to do this. The current element equals array of i. And then what you do next is you want to check. So you want to check the top of the heap. Is it larger, right? Top of heap equals results. Oh, and I forgot as well, or if k equals to zero, then you just return an empty list, right? Because it doesn't matter that much. Now, next, top of heap is equals to your results at zero, right? So that would just give you like the top of the elements. And you wanna do something like if top of heap is smaller than the current element, or right? if it is a smaller, and you know it's not gonna be the same because there are no duplicates, right? So if the top of heap is less than your current element, then you want to do heap q dot heap pop results, right? 
and then you want to do heap q dot heap push results and current element okay so this is this part right here if larger than top of heap pop and then insert into the heap okay there so now at the end return results cool so let's try this okay so here's why i really like having um test cases established earlier on because now i can just say like print find top k i give it that and then k is three so hopefully this works oops oh, i totally forgot about this okay so all right so let's define this okay what how what would how would this thing work define fill in heap array and k okay so this is basically taking an array or just call it results equal empty and what you're doing is you're walking through the array for i in range of zero through k and you want to put it into your heap heap q dot heap push results and array i return results three seven and four okay cool awesome that's sort of what i was expecting all right let's try this again let's try one and then return seven two which is four and seven three is three seven four four is two three four seven and five is one two four seven three and then six which is return empty array cool awesome great 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 so that is exactly what I would expect in here. And I think this is pretty good for our first pass. Okay. Cool. So what other test cases will you give here, right? Typically at this point in the interview, someone's going to say, hey, how will you improve this? How will you make it even better? Okay, so the first thing is, you know, maybe adding more test cases is a really, really simple thing to say. And I, I think a lot of people kind of throw it out there, but they don't actually think about what are some edge cases that would break your code, right? So again, like we mentioned earlier, here you're checking for arrays none, length of array is zero, k more than the length, and then k is zero. So you make sure that, you know, you kind of mention those things because those are sort of the edge cases there. Um, and then you're making some assumptions here where like the array is not sorted, only has integers and has no duplicates. In those cases, do you wanna actually test this, right? So for example, if we had like another seven in here, how would that work? Okay. One, two, three, seven, seven, four. Yeah, I guess it still does work in, in, a, in a sense, but then maybe that's not what you would expect it to work. Um, and so yeah, so you come up with your test cases and you make sure you cover all of them. Um, K is from zero, maybe minus one. That could be a good test as well. Um, oh, actually, that's a good test case. That's a great test case, actually. So if you put K is zero and I gave it minus one, there you go. Okay, so that would break my code right there. So that's a good test case to check for there. Okay, so I've kind of covered a lot of the edge cases there. I think this would work. Um, so two and then one, zero, there you go. Okay, cool. So moving on, improvements. How would I improve this code? So first of all, um, I don't really like that the code like i'm doing multiple like for loops in here maybe is there any way i can just like not filling the heap and then um just do it directly in one for loop rather than doing it in a separate function i think that's one possibility right so i think i, I think that typically the more hoops that you have to jump through in a code typically that's not a great idea so that's one way of improving this code here. Um, another thing is, you know, there are a lot of cases where this would possibly break. Um, for example, if my array cannot be contained with, within a single machine, how would this thing change? I think that's one thing I would think about here. And another thing here, I don't really like that it's doing a heat pop and heat push. Uh, maybe there's a different function that would be much more efficient because 
I guess we can take a look here. I, I think that HeapQ right now has a better uh, implementation for that. Great. So yeah, there you go. That's how I would tackle a uh, coding problem. So yeah, there you go. Um, so that's how I would tackle this problem and hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, let me know what you think about the problem. It's very common. You see that in a lot of uh, lead code or you see that you know a lot of uh, companies use ask that question. Uh, I'm not a huge, I think that it's just been asked so many times. So leave a comment and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.